You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 24 The Drowning of the Gun. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Norman Lau. And I'm Earl Green. Each week on Mission Log Genealogy, we break the early TV writing of Gene Roddenberry free from the chains of obscurity and give it a fresh look for the kind of morals, meanings, and messages that were the hallmarks of Gene's later work. This week, we examine an episode of West Point co-written by Gene, The Drowning of the Gun, to see if it still makes a splash after its original broadcast in 1957. Earl will be back with a flood of trivia in a moment, but first, here's how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And please remember your comments could be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now, here's Earl Green with this week's trivia. Thank you, Norman. And everyone, if you will indulge me, we have a lot of trivia for this episode. First off, we have another joint writing credit. This episode was written by Gene Roddenberry and E. Jack Newman. This is not an insignificant credit. Ernest Jack Newman was a veteran writer from the golden age of American radio drama who had come to his writing career a little bit late. Originally studying law at UCLA, he was sidelined by tuberculosis contracted while serving with the Marine Corps in the South Pacific during World War II. He turned to writing and was already selling radio scripts while he was still on active duty with the Marines. He returned to UCLA now as an instructor teaching writing, and he taught at USC as well. When television emerged as a medium hungry for writers, Newman didn't have to be told twice where the money was. This is one of two West Point episodes bearing his credit, and he went on to write episodes of Wagon Train, Jefferson Drum, The Twilight Zone, Kane's Hundred, and created such series as Sam Benedict, A Man Called Shenandoah, Petrocelli, and most famously, Police Story. His last TV credit was in 1990, and we lost E. Jack Newman in 1998. He and Gene remained longtime friends, and he spoke at Gene Roddenberry's memorial in 1991. It's safe to say that we'll be mentioning him again on Genealogy in the future. Jack Haley Jr. guest stars as Cadet Davis, and according to IMDb, this is Jack's only screen acting credit. Short trivia day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Wait, what? That can't be right. Except that it is. But surely more was expected of the son of the actor who played the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz? Yes, but here's the thing. Jack Haley Jr. went on to be a renowned producer and director and occasional writer of Hollywood retrospective specials and films. As early as 1962, he was writing and directing such TV specials as Hollywood, The Fabulous Era, the TV series Biography, revived many years later by A&E with Peter Graves as the host, And, this one's for you, John Champion, he wrote a 1965 TV special called The Incredible World of James Bond, and a 1969 TV special called Frank Sinatra Jr. with Family and Friends. Speaking of friends of the family, Jack was briefly engaged to Nancy Sinatra. He was married for five years to Liza Minnelli. His skill at putting together retrospective pieces like all of these, with some glitz and glamour, carried over to the big screen as well with 1974's That's Entertainment. He continued to be associated with showbiz documentaries, some of them Peabody Award-winning well into the 90s. We lost Jack Haley Jr. in 2001. Arthur Storch as Cadet Saunders had a much longer acting resume and tried his hand at directing as well. He's best known for a small role as a psychiatrist in 1973's The Exorcist. Actor William Trailer as Cadet Johnson was a mainstay on the Ziv television program slot having already put in guest appearances on Highway Patrol and I Led Three Lives. We would see him much later in the Rolls Doll anthology series Way Out, Flipper, Bracken's World, 
Kung Fu, The Rockford Files, Days of Our Lives, and Dynasty. On the big screen, he was in The Towering Inferno, Colossus the Forbin Project, he was General Catbird in Buckaroo Banzai, and, most importantly, he was Mr. Underhill in both Fletch and Fletch Lives. I'm still waiting for Fletch to give me his MasterCard number. Cadet Proust is Holdenville, Oklahoma's own Clue Gulliger, truly one of Hollywood's most recognizable that-guy actors. This West Point episode was very early in Clue's career, and suffice to say, much more was yet to come, including one of Gene's episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel. You may know Clue as Sheriff Riker on The Virginian, another show for which Gene will write an episode, or from movie appearances in such films as Return of the Living Dead, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And finally, we have a really solid Star Trek connection in actor Paul Carr, who played a tiny, tiny part as Cadet Victor. Paul would go on to play the ill-fated Lieutenant Lee Kelso of the Enterprise in Where No Man Has Gone Before, Star Trek's second pilot episode, to say nothing of his multiple appearances on Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and a recurring role in the second season of Buck Rogers in the 25th Century as Lieutenant Devlin. You're up early, Mr. Davis. Good morning, sir. Couldn't sleep? No, sir. Neither could I. Relax, Mr. Davis. Well, the Reveille gun seems to have disappeared. Yes, sir, I noticed that. It usually winds up right about... there. How would you go about raising it, Mr. Davis? I'd try to locate a winch, sir. If none were available, I'd use lines and manpower. You'll find a winch in the boathouse and extra cable. You're in charge, Mr. Davis. Yes, sir. I'll get right on it. Mr. Davis. Sir? I've been impressed by your resourcefulness. Just one question left. This episode could be a victory of one temporary training company over another, or it could be a class victory. The first tradition of this yearling class. I've been thinking about that, sir. I think our yearbook will list it the same way yours did. And if you'll pardon me for saying so, sir, you do seem to know an awful lot about dumping Reveille guns in the lake. Act 1. Cadet Lieutenant Charles Thompson welcomes us to Camp Buckner, where cadets who have hit their first year at West Point go for two months of field training. And specifically, he's introducing us to Camp Buckner's Reveille gun, which might just be every cadet's least favorite piece of artillery, the one that wakes them up in the morning. We pick up the story of Six Company, whose jeep is stuck in a rut, just trying to get its machine gun on site for artillery exercises. First Company, on its way down the hill, is all done, and those cadets offer to help, but Cadet Davis turns down the offer of help. Things don't get much better the next day. Six Company is regularly showing up late and showing up last in the rankings of each day's exercises. Two of the ranking officers in charge of those exercises decide to go looking for Sixth Company, and they find them with their tank out of gas. Cadets have just brought fuel on foot, or so they thought. They actually hauled a tank of benzene up the hill, which is now in the tank, which now needs to be flushed before the tank can go anywhere. Oh well, tomorrow's another day. A day on which Sixth Company seems to have arrived at their destination first. They start digging out their artillery position. Only it's not their position. It's First Company's position. First Company arrives and lets Sixth Company keep digging. And once the digging is done, only then does First Company announce its presence and stake its claim. Thanks for doing the hard work for us, but you're on the wrong slope. Today's not their day either. Cadet Davis takes a bit of inspiration from the West Point yearbook. He decides to rally Sixth Company into pulling something big. Something for the future yearbooks. A little bit of sneaky disassembly of the mount for the Reveille gun has been known to have unpredictable results. And every West Point class that has managed this feat has gone down in the Academy's history books. If they can do this, well, they'll remember Sixth Company. There's just one problem. Their plan has been overheard by the cadet 
leading first company. Davis' first attempt to sabotage the Reveille gun ends very quickly when he's spotted by the TAC officer. But was he tipped off? First company denies it, but the next night, when six companies sets out to complete its mission, the Reveille gun has been chained down. Act 2. Sixth Company is starting to make a dent in the rankings. United around their goal of dunking the Reveille gun, they're showing a bit more esprit de corps in the rest of their exercises, too. But the men won't let Davis forget that the gun is their ultimate goal. He promised them they'd pull it off somehow. But now, not only is the gun chained at night, but it's checked hourly. Davis has a crazy idea. If they can't hacksaw through the chains under cover of darkness, why not do it under cover of daylight, when surely no one would be expecting them to do that? And over the weekend, when all the cadets bring their drags up to the lake at Camp Buckner, Davis sees a chance. He asks one lady to pose for pictures with Six Company, in front of the Reveille gun, while Six Company saws through the chains. But whose date is this young lady? None other than Cadet Saunders of First Company, but he doesn't pull her away. Might as well do Sixth Company a solid, you know, after they dug First Company's artillery position out for them. But in the meantime, he's planning to do what First Company does and dump the gun in the lake first. But when night falls, Davids and Sixth Company are dismayed to see that a guard has been posted at the Reveille gun. How easy is it going to be to outthink and distract a guard who's been at Camp Buckner receiving the same tactical training they've been getting? They spot First Company getting ready to set off flares as a distraction so they can claim the prize first, but Davis isn't having it. He and Sixth Company retreat, get into uniform, and convince the guard on duty that they're his relief. The guard on duty stands down and promptly runs into the TAC officer, and before a full explanation can be given, and before First Company can launch its diversionary tactics, splash! Glug, glug, glug. Nobody even needs to ask what that sound was. They know what it was. Their tradition has been upheld. The Reveille gun has gone for a swim. And after the sun comes up, Cadet Davis can't help but go to the empty gun mount and admire his handiwork. It seems almost like the TAC officer is waiting for him. Davis tries to play it cool and ends up being put in charge of retrieving the Reveille gun from the bottom of the lake and putting it back in its rightful place. The Major compliments Davis on Sixth Company's victory against the Reveille gun, which is when Davis realizes that the Major himself did this when he was a cadet. After a moment of mutual admiration, it's back to business. Let's get that gun out of the lake so the tradition can continue. The end. Excellent job with the recap, Norm. As soon as you've topped off your tank from that misadventure, what do you say we get into our observations from this episode? Yeah, I loved um, Charles C. Thompson's, you know, our cadet that starts off every single West Point telling us about at least for the Gene Roddenberry episodes, uh, this is the first time we've been introduced to Camp Buckner and the Reveille gun. And that in and of itself is a very interesting thing. But I was really not aware of a Camp Buckner. So I thought I'd go online and see what Camp Buckner was and is and give us a little bit of a history lesson like we are want to do here on genealogy. So here's the history of Camp Buckner for anyone who would like to know. And this is on the internet, so you can find this on Wikipedia. Camp Buckner was at first a World War II training camp, first established as Camp Popolopen in 1942 on Popolopen Lake, Orange County, New York. Renamed Camp Buckner on November 14, 1945, after General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr., former Commandant of Cadets at the United States Military Academy, that's West Point, who was killed in action on January 18, 1945, during the battle for Okinawa in World War II. This camp serves as a summer training camp for USMA cadets, and it is an active military camp to this day. So I thought that was neat, just to have this tradition, not just because it's in the show and you actually get to see an actual camp, but it's actually the tradition and an actual active military camp now. Yeah. And here's the thing. I love this setting. I love this setting so much. I think I mentioned in a past episode that I spent 
spring and summer of one year. It was kind of the year of thousand short-term jobs. I played a civilian role in some National Guard exercises at Fort Chaffee, which was not too far distant from where I was living, and hung around with a lot of National Guard guys who were training before they shipped out overseas, primarily to the Middle East. And there really was... One thing I love about this episode is there's a real camaraderie to the characters. There are rivalries as well, but there's a real camaraderie to it. And let me tell you, that is absolutely real. Yeah, even though I am not... I have never served in the military, just hanging around all these guardsmen who were going through these exercises. A camaraderie does develop. You all laugh about the same weird off-color jokes. You're all getting eaten alive by the same mosquitoes. Yeah, it's nice to have them them being the uh, the plebs in the class kind of isolated into this yearling training formation that they're they're going through because yeah, you're right. If if they are all training, they're all training for one purpose, even though that there are like these little segmented camps of competitive units, like the first and six brigades or the first and six units, you know, that are going after each other. But I do like seeing the real B-roll footage that's being shown in this episode, uh, just to show like what it's all about, what the trainees looked like back in 1957. I also liked that uh, in Tom, um, Charles Thompson's voiceover that he's talking about the most or one of the most famous classes that trained at Camp Buckner. And that was the West Point class of 1915, of which he mentions two of probably the most famous generals like in the United States military of all time. And that would be Omar Bradley and Dwight D. Eisenhower, Omar Bradley being the general in charge of the entire Eastern, the European and Pacific theater at the same time. And he was like the guy. And then Eisenhower, obviously, you know, we know Eisenhower, uh, who went on to become uh, president. So yeah, very economical writing in the voiceover. Yeah. And among the both the B-roll and the A-roll because you know, you know some of this had to be purpose filmed for this episode. They started showing footage of tanks and I just I got so happy because like okay, we're finally saying the quiet part out loud here. This is what the army is training for. I love that specifically that's the the M48 Patton. Uh, that took over for the the M4 uh, Abrams and the Pershing and earlier patent versions like after World War II and then into Korea. So there's a there's a video game that I played for too many hours called World of Tanks. <laughs> so you know you get to see a lot of these tanks up close and personal. And the the real kind of like the telltale sign on the M48 are those handrails across kind of like the upper hull. Um, and it's not quite as boxy and rounded, say, as the Sherman tank. And they also have the gunning emplacement, which our two guys from Six Company were late uh, in delivering uh, at the very beginning of the episode. So they had no machine gun embankment on their tank. You ever stood next to one? Um, not recently, no. But yeah, like in museums and stuff. Like the, you know, the M48s, anything more recent than that with the handrails like that? Craning your neck to look up at them. It's like, OK, now I understand why the handrails are there. They're taller than I think people realize. Oh, much taller, you know, much taller and much louder. <laughs> I can tell yeah, you I that mean, from experience. Standing from like the bottom of a tread to the top of a tread alone, that's like seven feet. Yeah. I don't know how these guys just jackrabbit up onto that thing, but they're in much better shape than I am. I found myself wondering for just one second if that bazooka had been returned by those guys who stole it in that Highway Patrol episode. <laughs> we have a bazooka. Yeah, it's kind of goofy. And we can do anything with it, like blow up bank and all the money inside as well. Yeah, you know what? There are a couple things that are a little quirky about this episode, though. I mean, we are dealing with a given West Point cadets. So the given is a standard level of intelligence. But as you said before, this is kind of like a comedy without being a comedy so there's a little bit of an Abbott Costell like, you know, you know, whose tanks on first with the fuel situation at the beginning, because each one of these tanks in training has a giant number, you know, emblazoned on the hull. Very hard to miss. Except for these two guys who ended up missing it and filling the tanks with benzene instead of the proper fuel. It just seemed a little much. Okay, can I defend these cadets for just a second? Didn't they say that... Absolutely. Did they not say that they fueled the tank up in pre-dawn hours? Um, probably. Did you see those numbers? 
Could I? Under those lighting conditions? I'm not a West Point cadet training as a year. Yeah, leader. okay, okay. I see how we're going to You know, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I, know that, I know that there's a purpose to it. I get it. But even if they filled up the wrong tank, why did they bring benzene? Like, did they grab it from, like, the motor pool and they just didn't get the right tank? Yeah, I have questions about that. You, you know, did, did no one stop them? You know, right. did no one do the Nathan Fillion meme and, ah... Uh, yeah, like I always thought that these things have to be checked out, like either from the motor pool or from quartermaster and have those things assigned to units so that exactly. they can inventory their resources. But I don't know. Who knows? I'm sure that there was something going on behind the scenes anyway. I think the point is, is that they are ne'er-do-wells and we want to root for them because we're all on the same team, right? Speaking of all on the same team, all those pure white cadet uniforms uh, in parade formation at the end of these exercises were spectacular. They reminded me of the Battlestar Galactic episodes when the Colonial Warriors went into the guide thing and they turned into all white uniforms. They just looked great, especially in black and white film. I I kept on looking at those and my brain would only go to one place. How do you keep those clean? Right? You know, laundry day was yesterday, so that's the, you know, kind of thing I'm I'm prone to think. You know how you keep them clean? Underclassmen. That's how you keep them clean. <laughs> Someone could- that's what that's you know that, that, that's what underclassmen do in, in these institutions they do like they measure chocolate ice cream they pour the wrong beverage and they clean white uniforms that's what you do yeah i guess you, oh man can you think about at that camp you're at that camp and you're there for weeks yep oh and you've got to keep those oh man that's i know it's tough it, yeah it, like i said laundry day was yesterday so this is just it, it, this is triggering sorry I love seeing uh, Saunders uh, camouflaged in a way, not even really camouflaged, but eavesdropping when six companies and Davis are trying to strategize stealing the gun. It's very comedy of a type. Yeah, right? uh, he's TV camouflaged. You know, he's leaning around the corner. <laughs> you know, if he had hey, a mustache, it doing? would be twirling. <laughs> you know, if mustache right. is a regulation, he would be twirling it. Or Mr. Roper or Mr. Furley, they'd be like, what? And their eyes would bulge out. What, me? Yeah. Eavesdrop? No. <laughs> I love in the beginning of Act 2, though, um, as we were talking about the Reveille gun, like how there are different phases of somebody knowing that something's happening or hoping that somebody, you know, would take the responsibility of holding tradition. So I love seeing the chains at the beginning. Just you're like, hey, look, this is our new starting point, you know, for the second half of this story. Yeah, we're just letting you know the stakes have been raised that much. Now, mm-hmm. also in the second half, now this was some of the B-roll you were talking about of, you know, I'm presuming actual exercises with, yeah. with real cadets that were filmed by second unit or something. That zip line down and then dunk into the water in the lake. Okay, I'm not going to lie, that looks kind of fun. I don't know exactly what the, the training point of that is. And I'm not saying that I'm signing up for basic tomorrow or anything, but that looks fun. I, I love it when it works. But when it doesn't work, then you get content for the gram with these things because there's a lot of zip line fail <laughs> on the gram. But I guess that's why you practice places like Camp Buckner. Here's what I love about this era is that, or at least in this series, they reference certain things that were new to us. And we hear the reference of the drags again, the girlfriends that come to camp and you know visit with their boyfriends, fiancés, what have you. But I love how blatantly obviously 1950s era traditional like some of the naming conventions are because you have johnny who's i guess that's cadet saunders and his girlfriend's name's betty it's so perfectly stereotypical you know and you can hear like first company like yeah we're gonna get the machine gun we're gonna do it for johnny you know it's just it's saccharinely cute. Yeah, I, it just it put me in mind of a really irritating song I used to play back when I uh, was working my first job in oldies, so-called oldies radio. You know, kooky, lend me your comb. <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> Why, no, Betty. We are going to win this championship. Will you, Johnny? Will you? That would be dreamy. <laughs> that kind of thing. But there also is, I mean, aside from how cute that is, there's also something that, again, was very stereotypical, maybe, of the dynamic at the time. You had that one guy in First Company, Saunders, 
I don't know, his lackey or his second in command, who's always that sneering guy. He's like, yeah, we're going to get you again, Six Company, because you're not first company. Yes, the hand ringer. You know, he's kind of like the, uh, you know, he was that guy to Rick in Casablanca. He's like, yes, Rick. Yes, Rick. We're going to win, Rick. Oh, no. You're not going to get our money. You know, that guy. Oh, no. um, it's the Peter Laurie <laughs> of West Point. It's the Peter Laurie of West Point. <laughs> Time to get into some more serious discussions about this episode, which is maybe just a little bit of a challenge, Norm, because this was not the most serious of episodes, and yet there is stuff to talk about here, and yet it's also very lighthearted. I love that balance. How about you? Yeah, you know, like, so I've recently um, done a catalog of all of the West Point episodes, and there are varying degrees of what list is correct or isn't correct or in the right order or isn't. But one of the things I've, I think I'm going to try and challenge myself with is actually watching this entire series because there are 39 episodes of roughly around 25, 26 minutes a piece. And I'm wondering how much of these episodes or how many of these episodes are in this type of particular light comedy vein. Cause there's comedy that, works too hard to be comedy and then there's comedy that works very well because there's an organic reality to it where certain things even if they don't really feel like they're organic they are manufactured for a point of storytelling they do work you know they do educate the audience they do take us on a narrative ride it doesn't have to be end of the world it doesn't have to be life altering but at the same time though it is life-altering in a way because some of the things that we've discovered through the course of these mishaps are incredibly profound. And I think that that's where Gene's deafness in his writing, or maybe E. Jack's, E. Jack Newman, he maybe was able to impart maybe some of this humor from his writing standpoint as opposed to from Gene's writing standpoint. Yeah, and I find myself wondering, you know, Gene and E. Jack Newman were close friends for a very long time. It's kind of interesting. You think about it, going back to Star Trek, going back to the PAX movies that happened in the early 70s, Gene doesn't have a lot of collaborators who get their names on the script with him. Now, that's that gets to be a complicated thing because... Screen credits are determined sometimes by Writers Guild arbitration. You, know, you actually have to go through something of an adversarial process to say, this person contributed this to this script, but this person only contributed this. All right, well, that determines who gets teleplay credit, who gets story credit. Is there shared teleplay credit? Or is it just written by? Can you just boil it down to sole authorship. Going back to a lot of a lot of the way that people write about Star Trek in particular, assigning sole authorship to Gene, I understand that there is that temptation to do that. He did create the show, but a lot of the fabric of what the franchise became did come from other people, like specifically Dorothy Fontana and Gene Kuhn, and David Gerald, and other collaborators who were there early on, they may have gotten their names on some scripts, but they also had huge influence from behind the scenes. And so, I always caution against judging stuff by what the screen credits say, and attributing sole authorship of ideas to one person. This turned out so well, I wondered why we don't have more of these co-write credits with Gene and Jack Newman, because this really, this was one of my favorite West Point episodes we've watched so far, and I'm, I hope I'm not jumping straight to the, uh, straight to the wrap-up there, but this is one of my favorites. It is so relatable. I don't know about you, I have much more in common with Sixth Company than with First Company. Especially since I, you know, I don't have a, a a toady standing next to me the whole time, every day, going, 
you know, wringing his hands. Oh, like, Earl. Yes, yes Earl. Boss. You are correct, Earl. Yes, boss. That's what we're <laughs> going to do. Are you saying your cats don't say that to you at all? N- no, I'm their henchman. You know, the tone of this episode, uh, it, it, I think one of the reasons why I think it, it's very connective, maybe to us or maybe to other audiences that watch it now, is because there is a kind of underdog quality to Sixth Company. Now, again, I want to premise this from the entire standpoint of all of these cadets were chosen to be trained at West Point to become officers of the United States military. This is the elite core of officers for the United States military. But at the same time, though, and we've said this before, uh, not only in this show, but like even in talking about you know Starfleet or the United Federation of Planets, there is a spectrum. There's a bell curve of who is the best, who is not. But the bottom line is anyone who is in Starfleet and above in that system is still the best. There's just now you start from a completely different curve. So I think that in this story, when you see kind of like a couple of the ne'er-do-wells from the Sixth Company and Davis's frustration with trying to rally his troops together, you do feel a certain sympathy towards these characters because we've all been there before, right? And I think that that's a a very uh, responsible way of uh, trying to to impart some type of wisdom to your audience is like connect with that one type of human uh, experience that we've all had and we've all been either picked for the wrong team or we've been chosen to lead a team of misfits or you know we're always behind the eight ball you know or there's always the cobra kai team that's beating us at the tournament until we become the scrappy bad news bears and walter Matthau kind of teaches us that one lesson that we need to learn and then or in today's parlance with cobra kai and karate kid until you get miyagi you really don't understand how much you actually are coming together to learn, to work together, and to overcome and achieve. So that's something translatable from 1957 to now. I think that in the human experience, that doesn't change. Everyone loves to be able to be part of a winning organization. Everyone loves to be recognized for their participation. But I think the one thing is, even though that you have all of this competition going on within the different companies, you're still all the same major team. Going back to uh, a couple episodes ago, whether it was the command or basically almost every other example in, in West Point, when one of the officers says to some of these younger cadets, remember, we're all part of the same team. Remember that you're going to be fighting alongside this person shoulder to shoulder, and it's your job and it's their job to bring out the best in you, not to be better than but to bring out the best. That was Bellman and uh, Tanner, Tanner yeah. from the command. It's, it, that's the lesson, right? You know, like we're not here to best each other. We're not here to put each other down. We're here to compete to make each other the best we possibly can be. And I'm, I like that that's where we got at the end of this episode. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to the, the phrase that you brought up a while back, iron sharpens iron. The competition is not to, you know, we're not out to crush somebody. We are trying to lift all boats here, basically. Right. Or all guns. Yes. You know, <laughs> if that's the case. But I think that another thing that um, maybe was a little bit more pointed towards the audience at the time, since you are directing this show towards all these different individual TV sets with all these different individual audience members in that certain age group, I think it's a really important thing. And, and, and I'm not sure if it's is, uh, I, I'm looking at this just in terms of what I believe was happening. I don't think this is maybe the case because television production studios don't, I don't think really ju- usually care about the end result. But if the end result is being a lesson imparted to all these different individual men, young boys, young men, and teaching them that if you all come together for a certain cause, you can do these great things. Even though that you're from different backgrounds, even though you're from different parts of the country, when you're there at Camp Buckner, the oars are all rowing in the same direction in the same boat. You're all achieving a certain goal. And I think that that's important, you know, and just in terms of the the philosophy of having something to achieve. It's hard to get across without being too preachy. And I think that that's where all of these different instances of the TAC officer and all these different episodes comes into play so well, because... The officer that challenges Davis at every turn, he's the one that I believe is putting all of these different obstacles in both of these companies' ways because there's a specific scene that I really liked where he's talking about 
strategy with the two different companies. And Saunders and Davis, the leaders of their respective companies, first and sixth, they both have different approaches. And the TAC office is like, okay, let's see whose approach is the better. And I think that's being applied to the gun. And I think that's why he's so proud of Davis in the end, because Davis is coming from behind and he pulled his unit together to be able to do this impossible task, which not only builds morale for six, but it builds morale for everybody. Yeah, because you have to assume, uh, I am assuming that it's not just first and six companies at Camp Buckner for all these weeks. Yeah, I'm assuming uh, second through fourth companies, or second through fifth companies, are also there. And they're in the middle, and we're just not hearing from them in this episode because it's not right, germane right. to the plot. I really felt like the, the Reveille gun, it, it's kind of like the pinata of this episode. Yep. Yep. It has been set up. Everyone can grab a baseball bat or whatever and go take a whack at it. But there are obstacles that you have to overcome before you even get to it and take that swing. Davis is fixated on this from the beginning, and the TAC officer clearly has Davis's number from the outset. I mean, even when they have the girl posing in front of the gun, and one of the cadets is back there hacksawing through the chains with all this commotion in front of him, and the commanding officers are back there with, you know, binoculars. I always love TV binoculars, just two circles. Yeah, <laughs> It's not what real binoculars look like, but, you know, TV binoculars, movie binoculars. They obviously know what's going on. If it was something they felt needed to stop, they would stop it. Sure. But instead, it's the piñata. It's just like, how bad do you want that piñata? How bad do you want that candy in there? Well, it's a, a general um, message that has been, you know, uh, weaved in pretty much every episode of West Point that we've seen so far. It's like West Point... They want to produce leaders that can adapt. They want to produce leaders that think. They want to produce leaders that are flexible, that can accommodate whatever change is thrown their way. And I, I really like that, again, in this kind of lighthearted version of probably a very you know, traditional and very serious lesson learned, that is the case. That you know, Saunders maybe was relying too much on opportunity. And when opportunity prevented itself, like the machine gun, like the gas, like the foxhole, he was able to, and even I, I think he articulated this in saying, hey, look, they dug the foxhole for us. You told us to take advantage of the terrain that was available to us. Well, this is part of it. And, you know, the tech office is like, yeah, you're right. You know, kind of a technicality, but I can't fault you for that. But that's first, you know, that's first company's strategy. That's their MO. Six companies, like whatever it takes to get the job done, we'll do it within reason and obviously within the rules. And I think that that's where, you know, the audience is a little bit more, you know, sympathetic to and identify with that reality of, of their own personality. You know, I am usually not first, but it's nice to be able to get a win every once in a while. And it's also nice to see first company acknowledge that win, because when you do that, you know, the, the individuals become greater than parts, you know, uh, the sum of their parts. And that goes back to that army of one that we were talking about. This is, I think, more in tradition of that particular statement than anything else, where it's not just one that wins, they all win. You know, that's an, that's an old sentiment. You know, it's in business. You know, it's in all these different types of philosophies when it comes to, like, building up morale. Like, if one victory for an organization is a victory for all, you know, and, and you know, the opposite is true as well. So I kind of wonder, obviously, this is a tradition, as has been pointed out so many times. So I wonder, the morning that the gun disappears into the lake with this almighty sploosh. Does everyone get sleep in? Well, as far as, like, you know, heavy metal giant cannons go, this one has been thoroughly soaked, waterlogged, and now, Earl, it's our job at the end of Mission Log Genealogy to fish that thing out and see if we can fish out any messages, morals, or meanings, as we always do with every Mission Log episode, you know, from our standard Mission Log to here. That's the fun of this. That's, you know, and, and also looking to see what the through lines are that uh, we've seen in this episode that may have uh, started to weave their way into future Gene Roddenberry works, as is part of what we do here on Genealogy. So grab a couple towels, 
you know, grab a couple sponges, uh, grab a couple buckets, and uh, let's get this thing dried up. What do you say? Maybe we should have brought this up in observations. You better break out a bucket of rustoleum for that gun, as many swims as it has taken. I mean, that is one waterlogged piece of old iron. I think we were discussing this actually in the VAM in a previous episode, which you can hear all of that if you join the Mission Log Discord, by the way. Whether it's in a multiplayer video game or in this crazy thing we call life, there is something uniquely character-building about being the underdog and beginning the race so far from the starting position that the light from the starting position will take three million years to reach you. Or maybe, say, working for the last-rated, most under-budgeted TV station in town? I don't know. Not sure where I got that idea. This reveals who you are. You will either complain and gripe about it the whole time and still lose, or it will make you more determined to play for all the marbles. It will reveal to you and to everyone around you who you are, even if you don't win. You have made the effort, and that in itself is telling. By the end of that competition, you find out who you are. And whether you rise to the challenge or use it as an excuse, you know, oh, well, I was never going to come out on top. There was too much against me. Either way, who you are at your core will have been revealed by multiple instances of being the underdog, full stop. Now, let me buffer that statement by saying that I realize that this is something of an imperfect metaphor because we have reached a phase of social awareness, especially in the United States, where discussions of things like privilege do reveal that some people have been placed at a huge systemic disadvantage. So I want to point out that's not necessarily what I'm talking about here. Now, I am aware of that, and I do try to check my own real-life assumptions against that. So I don't want to minimize or ignore that discussion or that struggle at all. A great many people do wind up disadvantaged in a constant struggle that they never signed up for. I get that. I get that. But still, on being the underdog, you find out who you are. You have the opportunity to decide if who you are is who you want to be or if there's room for improvement. And I believe that is what this story was about. We were casting Six Company as the underdog and finding out if they wanted to remain the underdog or not. And that's the, I think the beauty of this episode is again, we were talking about West Point cadets. They've already like achieved individually being able to overcome a a certain hurdle. And that's actually getting into West Point. Remember, this is the United States military Academy. They are accepting individuals who they believe, at least in the application process and maybe even in the interview process, cadets who they believe are going to be future leaders of the United States military, of the United States Army in particular. So they've already been able to overcome that particular hurdle. Now they are competing against, it's kind of like Top Gun, right? You're competing against the best of the best. There's only going to be one Iceman. There's only going to be one Maverick. There's only going to be one Slider, one Goose, you know, one Sundown, one Merlin, all of those characters, right? But some of them are going to be the best of the best, like they said about Tom Kaznansky, Iceman, or some of them are going to be way behind in the polls, you know, and especially where Matt was concerned after he lost Goose. So how do you overcome that? How do you all become part of the same team again? Well, you focus your attention on what really is the true enemy, and the true enemy is the true enemy, or you manufacture one. And I think that that's where the TAC officer was really smart, because he knows that there's potential in all of the individual cadets and their units, and he sees it. And he manufactures something to encourage and draw out that potential. And then once he sees certain check marks or milestones close to being met, he creates another hurdle for them and another and another. And by that, that repetition only brings them together further and further along the way to become the leaders that they're supposed to be. I love in this scene where the TAC officer says, you know, he says this to Davis at the end, you know, in a few years, 
you might find yourself working to keep some cadet from dunking the gun. I hope you have better luck than I did. That in and of itself is saying you learned, achieved, and overcame. That's the point of all of this, right? I mean, I love how Davis is understanding what the TAC officer is saying, but in a completely deeper way, right? So it's not just about this rivalry that he's created, you know, between these two companies. It's not about one leader versus the other leader. You know, it's about this tradition of these older officers teaching these younger officers how to become these better older officers later on because it's tradition, right? It's this passing of the torch. It's the responsibility for educating and inspiring the next generation. That's the lesson to encourage the potential from one generation to another. So how do you encourage future potential? You do it by recognizing that there's potential in the first place. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured John Champion as the TAC Officer and Mikhail Balian as Cadet Davis. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the Mission Log Discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry Archive, drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com. On the next genealogy, one last visit to West Point in duty, honor, and trouble. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shabel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takechi. We'll be back next week with more of your favorite programs. Our broadcast day. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.